This is an exciting topic, um, trauma, if you think of it in a positive way. Trauma is um, a life-changing event, different for each one of us, according to our individual path. We're each different. We have different histories. We are souls, but we're unique souls, and we have our own stories. Um, so uh, Sister mentioned about cancer, and um, I always told the doctors that um, I will never get cancer because it's not a part of my family history. So needless to say, I was very shocked with the diagnosis at the age of 55. So what happened for me is I'm not going to go into my story of having cancer, but I did spend a year pretty much alone in isolation, going through a bone marrow transplant. And so you have to be isolated so that that new blood can be allowed to grow and you have no immune system, so you cannot be around too many other people. You cannot be traveling, be in large crowds. So what happened was I was feeling very anxious. And anxiety has always been a little theme going through my life. As long as I can remember, but I always just didn't think about it too much. And it just was kind of like there, but. I wasn't really conscious of it. Or I wasn't really aware of it very much. I would get busy going to school or working or doing. And so put it in the background. So what happened was I, through this experience of being alone and getting to know myself better, things became very quiet. And I was not as interested in television. I could not watch the news. It was too... Um, violent and I would felt so stripped so stripped to my core not only physically but emotionally and to the soul to my soul and I actually had an out-of-body experience where I was out of my body looking at my uh, body that was very very sick one night and I was very close to death I was in septic shock and I made a call to my husband to come and help me. Please come to the hospital now. I need help. So I believe that the soul is very powerful. And the soul is, is like um, knows when there's something wrong and will take charge and say, you know, um, this is what you need to do. So I've always had that belief in the power of discernment and um uh, the power to discriminate and make good decisions and to be quick on your feet. Um, I always worked in a lot of crisis situations with high-risk kids, and I've seen a lot and been a part of a lot behind the scenes. So, um, but one thing that I really, when I, everything settled down and I came back home and now everything is going well. Everybody kind of left my life and went back to their work and their life. And here I am kind of sitting here and I'm thinking, and now I'm thinking and I'm thinking, I'm thinking, is it gonna come back? Oh, I feel something. Oh no, what is that? I get sick. I'm like, oh no, it's back. Call, call the doctor, you know? And so this is what we call waste thoughts because I didn't know if they were real or not. It's I was driven by a universal fear, which is called, will the cancer return? And so this was um, starting to really nag at me and bother me. And so I told my doctor, because I've always been the person that's reached out for help. I've always gone places where I can get help. I've never been afraid to ask for help. If I need to go to counseling, I go for counseling. If I need to go get help for a family problem, then I go find somewhere to help me. So I told him and he said, you know what? Meditation is wonderful for post-cancer patients. Why don't you give it a try? So I had gone to the... Uh, place here in Fresno on 4th Street a few times to World Meditation Day with a friend. And so I thought, okay, well, that place is close to my house. 
and there won't be that many people there. And I threw myself into uh, the first class, which is I am a soul. And I believe that, okay, there's not a problem with that. And then I continued to go on with the classes. Well, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to keep going. So I started repeating the classes. <laughs> and then um, I met Sister Vina and she was like, who is this person that wants to repeat the classes? <laughs> you know? And so she came in and I just began really throwing myself into meditation. And it was suggested that I start early morning meditations. And I thought, mm, I don't know about that. You know, I was a late sleeper and um, I was retired at the time. And so I was sleeping in. And uh, so, but I tried it and I had an experience. Now, I cannot tell you that that will be your experience. It was my experience. It was right here in this room, but I felt the presence of the light. I felt the presence, I felt it, and I, it was like I was kind of like just, there was like foggy light all around me, but what I felt was I felt this total acceptance and this total love, this warmth, this spiritual parent coming in and just like the, like the flyer, it's like he just, of course, he's not physical, but it felt like he had my heart in his hands, literally holding my heart. And it moved me to such tears that tears were just flooding down my face. And then it was gone. Um, so I took that as emotions kind of breaking up inside that maybe were a little bit blocked and not the beginning of my journey was really now I'm ready to to really throw myself into meditation and have this experience um, with this higher being. Uh, I want to call the source back in <laughs> and get some help. And so that's what I did. And I learned that that my heart is like my garden and that I can be, this came over time, a lot of time because I was, I could self-sabotage myself when I was doing really well. I began to see a pattern in my life where I could be doing really well and people would be telling me good job. And then I would do something to sabotage it. And it was almost like um, shooting myself in the foot. And I had watched other people do this. I watched people do it in graduate school that got kicked out of graduate school. And I began to identify that this was in me. And this was me being my own worst enemy. And so here begins my journey that I come here to treat anxiety and the fear of returning cancer. And instead, I get this journey to myself, to my inner self. And I get to explore who I am, what I am, and what am I here for? What is my purpose? Besides having a degree, besides being a survivor, um, what, what am I? And so I began to really um, sit in meditation and I would cry and I would um, go deep. Sometimes I went too deep too soon. Um, and I... I don't know. I listened a lot to Sister Denise and I think I thought I could do it. You know, she she did meditation for so many days and I thought, well, I'm going to try it. <laughs> and so I did it for all day and it was it was too much. It was too much too soon. And and I started because I started to get into some feelings. And then I started to feel kind of weird inside. And then I touched on some anger. And, um, and that anger couldn't be blamed on anybody else, even though I tried. Um, it really came back to the anger was already, it was already in within me. So this is how I had to continue my journey is really taking responsibility, um, feeling some hurt, feeling some pain, identifying that I was sabotaging myself at times and that there was a a better me waiting to be discovered um 
Um, it was inside of me. I just needed to uncover. So I think that trauma is actually, if you're open to the challenge, that an obstacle, something difficult that comes in your way unexpected and suddenly can also suddenly turn your life around to where you never thought you would be. And I started feeling like there's something bigger that is going to happen, but I don't really know what that's going to be. And the discovery slowly has been really discovering who I am and not being my own best enemy, my work, my own worst enemy, but being my own best friend. Instead of looking for my best friend out there, looking for my best friend within. And through the teachings in Raja Yoga, using those teachings and identifying what it is that this source is trying to tell me, what it is I didn't get maybe in the Bible fully. What is love? You know, I thought love was basically if I give love, I get love back, you know, and when I didn't get it back I was, or I didn't get approval, I would get angry inside or I would get very hurt and that would lead to anger. Anger was usually secondary. It was hurt that came first. So instead of my inner world being like a desert, it has become full of richness. It has become full of creative um, things that I don't even, I didn't even know about myself. Like I've always painted and I played piano at one time. And obviously I went to school for a long time, but the creativity is my thoughts, identifying my thoughts and then identifying what is it I'm feeling and having the power to change that for myself not looking for you to change, but me to change, to change my perspective. And remember that when I'm feeling angry and I'm feeling scared or hurt, it's because I've lost my perspective on who I am and I'm back into my wrong identity. That somehow you here, you're here to fulfill my needs. And you're here to approve of me and tell me I did a good job. And, you know, I need to do that for myself. And I need to do that for other people, not be looking for, for, from, for, from you, for me. And I think that when I, the soul, realized that I have a body, it's my body, but I'm not the body. And I keep practicing this during the day, not just at in the morning at 4 a.m., but keep checking in and reminding myself, what awareness am I in? Am I on the path or am I getting off the path? Am I in my wrong identity again of thinking that I need you to approve of me? I need you to be there for me. I need you to spend more time with me. These are all old beliefs and old thoughts. And they come up every once in a while. And I have to change them into my higher awareness, which is I am a soul and I'm full of peace, of love. I'm full of power, happiness, and bliss. When I charge my battery in the morning by accurately connecting to that source, and the key word is accurately, because I've heard different perspectives throughout my life that God is everywhere, that God is within us, that the Holy Spirit is within us. Is that a piece of God? Well, I never knew. What is that? 
I was always like questioning, who is God? I want to see God. I want to know God. Um, I want to know my father. I want to know whether he's angry with me. I want to know, does he love me? Am I lovable? And going back to trauma, usually there is a trauma that occurs in your childhood. Not always, but for me, there was, and there was, uh, there's nothing negative about it. It's just the truth is my mother was a teenage mother and my father was not a part of my story. And so in some ways I would use this to get on the pity potty. They call it the pity potty. And I would go into wasteful thoughts of why didn't he want me? Why didn't he want to know me? But this led to a vice called searching for love. And it led to the wrong partners. It led to um, more feelings of abandonment. And here I am sabotaging myself again. So I've always got to be aware that these things are in my past, but now they've changed. And that my abandonment is only me abandoning myself. It's not anyone else abandoning me. I am the one that chooses to be there for myself or to turn away from my true self. So this is what I've learned through, um, through cancer, through my early childhood, um, through hurts and harms along the way. And I've learned to identify where the patterns are. And this is um, a lot to do with Raja Yoga and really getting honest and going deep in meditation and not being afraid to look inside, not being afraid to have the tears, because I know that that's the way it's like a volcano. It, it has to bubble up. It has to fester up. And then once it festers up, it's gone. Or that comes back, then I need to go again and be honest with that source and tell him that, you know, I want to heal in this area and I, I want to let go of this. And I ask for help from him. I don't ask for help from people. I ask from help from the source. I call him in and I accurately connect with that beam of light. I did see that light when I was age 30. I was going through a really bad time. And I was going through a divorce with my kid's father. And I was very scared. I went to school later in life. And so that's a separate story. That was a long road itself. But so I was scared financially, I would say. And I was scared to be on my own and I felt rejected and abandoned. And so these were the fears that I had and this light, it poured into the doorway for just, I don't know, it felt like forever, but it was just for a moment. And I felt a little afraid. I felt a little afraid of this light that was just in the doorway, completely covering the doorway. And then it was gone. But I felt like the light was trying to let me know that I was not alone. And I would go through many, many challenges, but I never forgot the light. So I'd like to just say that to, to do with thoughts, when I get into a lot of waste thoughts, what I do is I tell myself, these are meaningless. These are not bringing you benefit and they're not bringing others benefit. And so I pull myself out because they're not meaningful. And I want to have thoughts that are meaningful. So when I study some spiritual material, it gives meaning to my life. It's something that I find a challenge, a good challenge, and I really like it. I really like it. I've always loved school. So it's like a spiritual school. That sounds exciting. I'm ready. You know, I'm retired now and I'm in that stage of retirement and things have happened in my life. And I want to be more aware 
of my internal self. Um, I had an exciting career. It wasn't really long, um, but it was exciting and it was never dull. Um, but some circumstances in my life um, within my own family, I needed to be at home. And so I chose to let go of that career. And to this day, I'm not unhappy about that. I'm totally at peace with that. So, you know, I've taken responsibility for my past and I don't beat myself up anymore for my past. And I can tell you that totally sets me free. It takes me out of any bondage and it takes me out of sabotaging myself. Now, I'm not going to say that I never, ever, ever do it, but the times that I do it are farther and farther between. And when I get triggered, I realize that this is not yet finished and I need to take it further into meditation. I need to explore more about what is going on. And I write a little letter and it's easier for me to tell God in writing. I feel it's more honest when I put it down with the pen and I can see it more with a new perspective and within myself. And then I just leave it until it comes up the next time. If it does come up the next time, then I need to address it again. And this is just part of the journey. It's a slow, gradual journey with some slips and falls, some twists and turns. And if I did it perfectly, I wouldn't be in this body, I'd be gone. My lessons would be learned. So I'm still here in the School of Spiritual Learning, the Spiritual University of Raja Yoga. And it's been a good ride and it's been an, not an easy ride at times. Um, my family is not real keen on me being in Raja Yoga. I would say my mother in particular, my kids are fine with it. My kids are very mm, free thinkers and they're fine with it. But my mother is a fundamental Christian. And so she really has some fears about this. And so we, I have to be careful how I navigate with her so that I don't create more damage, more hurt for her and try to understand where she's coming from. Recently, I've had uh, one of my best friends um, not agree with my choice either and express that openly to me. And I was not aware of it. And so I've taken a step back and had to look at my perspective, myself. Is there something I did or said that was harmful? And try to understand where she's coming from and what her fears are. So these are things that I do and I don't need to fix it. I don't need to change my life to um, get anyone's approval. Um, I don't need to step off my path and I don't need to sabotage myself today. This is growth for me, tremendous growth. I cannot tell you how many times that I have put myself in harm's way, thinking that that was a good decision, that I could handle it, that I'm strong, that is exciting, that is a challenge. You know, and now my challenges are different and they're healthy and they're not causing me harm. If they are, then I need to check myself. There's nobody out there I can blame. It's my mind. These are my thoughts. They're not creating those thoughts for me. I'm creating my thoughts. I am painting the canvas of my destiny. And I love that. I love that because I just could not quite understand this whole picture, you know? Um, and I was so busy focusing on your problems and trying to solve your problems. And what I realized that is a lot of my life, when I was in that solitude uh, during the treatment for cancer, I realized that a lot of my life had been, I've been running on adrenaline. 
I've been running from one crisis to another, whether it was in my family, whether it was trying to fix my mother, whether it was trying to talk to my brother about not drinking so much. It was trying to fix him that I had married. <laughs> and then when he left, it was trying to fix another person, maybe a girlfriend and her problems. It was never ending. And I felt this is where trauma is funny because here I am, I could die. I've got this aggressive disease that they're treating. They don't give me, they give me 30% survival rate. And I think one night, you know, I feel like a hundred pounds has come off my shoulders because I'm coming to some kind of realization that I need to have some kind of self-care. I need to stop focusing on all your problems and I need to, to clean up my act. And so this Raja Yoga creating a very beautiful inner world was very attractive to me. Um, and to find the real me, the powerful me, the genuine authentic self. Now this was something I taught in psychology. This is what I talk to people but I wasn't really sure whether I understood it deep down, you know, whether I really could hold my own heart in my hand and, and look in the inner mirror and see myself, you know, and really self-nurture me. Um, and so at times I felt disconnected in this life. I felt lonely at times. And I realized that's because I was not in my true self. I was disconnected from my authentic self, from the essence of who I am. And so I would look for peace in the ocean. I would, at the beach, I would look for peace in something in nature. I would look for peace. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going to the ocean and then and loving hearing the lapping of the ocean and looking at the whale out in the ocean or, or any of that experience. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that I thought that was the answer until I got back home and I was searching again. Well, what, where, where are we going to go? What restaurant are we going to go to? Where am I going to go out of town next week? Um, what dress am I going to buy? So I discovered that Keeping my life simple and easy was really freeing me to be me. That sounds crazy at first. And sometimes I know people look at me and go, wow, you know, your life is, um, I mean, don't you like vacation a lot? <laughs> or, you know, I mean, you're retired. Why aren't you like, I don't know. Everybody's like going on this vacation and that. and there's nothing wrong with traveling, but now I like to have my travel have meaning. It needs to have meaning. Everything in my life needs to have some meaning. And now my yes means yes, and my no means no. And it's not that it's wrong to say no, it's how I say it and why I say it. It's because I need it to have meaning. It needs to have some kind of touching to my spirit, to who I am. And so everything has changed. <laughs> it's so it's so strange to think back that being from Texas, I was a big meat eater, huge. And so that changed. So all these cultural things change. And I realized that this is not me. What I eat is not me. Being from Texas, that's not me. Being a woman, that's not me. Being older, that's not me either. Um, this gray hair, that's not me. Uh, you know, all these things that I thought were me are identifying with the body. And so I was always trying to feed that need, you know? I gotta dye my hair, I gotta do my nails, I gotta go here, I gotta go there. And so, you know, now I'm just myself and I take care of my body I exercise my body I eat 
the right things. Um, I eat healthy. But the the other thing that I feed is my mind. And I feed my mind with positive, positive thoughts, thoughts that will enrich my inner life. Like, if you want to use the word God, okay, God has a lot of, there's a lot of words. So I like to think of God in my, in my teachings. There's a lot of different names that help me get back into that moment. What is God? I always wanted to know what is God? God is a bestower of fortune. God is the bestower of happiness. Oh my gosh. But it says in the Old Testament that God was angry and he punished and he created havoc on this earth. What do you mean he's the bestower of happiness? <laughs> I was scared of him. What is he going to do to me? <laughs> what is the afterlife going to be like? Um, you know, these questions were always there. So can you can imagine when you're in septic shock and your blood pressure is totally bottoming out and the crash cart and the crisis team is in your room that I might be just going to sleep in a few moments. I feel very, very sleepy. But I wasn't scared. I, I wasn't scared. And so that experience, I'm not saying that I have totally defeated the fear of death. I have not. Every time I get my CBC done, I scroll through and my heart skips a beat and I start breathing heavier. And I think, oh, please, oh, please, let there not be any immature cells in there. Oh, please, let that bone marrow, that new blood, that blood be still working, that machine be still working. And so I still go through that. I do. But now I can kind of laugh and humor myself and um, I get through it more quickly and I don't like keep it within and I give I give gratitude I give gratitude every day that I've been allowed more time to study to develop myself to help others to help others find tools like I have to share those tools I don't consider myself like a teacher like an expert I consider myself to be a meditator and I share with others what it's done for me. And, and I know that it will do the same thing for them. I know this. I don't know how it will happen for them. And I don't need to know that. I know I have my own experience with God and their experience will be their own. So I don't try to put that on people. Um, but I do, I do like to share with people that did you know that you're a soul and not the body? I mean, did you ever really think about that? Like, do you want to do a meditation and feel that? Do you want to feel that peace and that happiness and that love? Like, do you want to love yourself? Can you imagine? Did I love myself? I'm, I don't know what I did. I don't think I did at times. And now, you know, like um, sometimes I look in the mirror and instead of looking at my hair, or, um, you know, like that my body is changing, it's getting older. Sometimes I just want to look in my eyes. I just want to reflect back of what I see. And that I don't do it all the time, but when I do, I feel this love. I feel this love and it goes back to an experience that I'm going to share. It was a really powerful experience. I had a chaplain that was meeting with me every day when I was at St. Agnes in Fresno and I was in isolation. I was totally neutropenic. I had no good immune system. So they were keeping me um, isolated from everyone. And she would come see me every day, except on the weekends. And she would say, you know, Kim, I don't know why I'm coming. I'm not supposed to be on this floor. But I feel that God is not telling me, but he's 
directing me, kind of inspiring me. I don't know how she said it to come to see you. I'm supposed to be on the second floor, but you're on the third floor. And so I'm doing what I'm inspired to do or guided to do. I would say guided. And so we would talk and I would tell her, you know, there's one thing I can't let go of. It's really big and I'm really embarrassed. And I told her, I said, but if I'm going to die, I, I, I want to get rid of this. And I'm kind of getting off track here a little bit, but she told me, you know, when you're ready to forgive and you're ready to let go of something, it means that you want to have good wishes for that person and you want to send that person love and the best wishes for their life. Are you ready to do that? And I said, I'm absolutely ready to do that. And so at that time I was into praying. And so we said a little prayer. And do you know that through that, I let go of that person that I was obsessing? Why did they do that? Why did they abuse me? Why were they mean to me? What did I do to deserve that? All those meaningless thoughts were like gone. They were gone. It was like a miracle. And when I saw that person several years later, he never knew I saw him. There was no contact. I was in my car driving by. He happened to be in the same location. I say this is not by coincidence. I had been kind of scared of him. And I felt neutral. I felt free. And I thought, you know, I do hope that I do hope that he has peace in his life and that he has healed. And then I let it go. So that is so that is healing coming out of trauma. That's another positive point. And the other one that I received through the trauma of having cancer was when I had the bone marrow transplant. They took me absolutely to death's door. And I was so weak after the transplant and so skinny. And I had no eyebrows. I had no hair. I had no eyelashes. I look like a little rat. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to describe, but <laughs> I looked pretty weird. And whenever I went out, I had to wear this big Darth Vader gas mask looking thing. It was horrible. And people would just turn away. And I know what they were thinking, cancer patient, patient, you know, and I would just kind of, I would lean on my husband. I was so weak and I could barely walk. But I was smiling inside. Now this is, this is the gift. This I'm smiling inside and I'm understanding how they feel because they probably feel I don't ever want that to be me. I know that's how I felt. I don't ever want that to be me. And so I understand that. And I would go into this little gym. I would wipe everything down. I would keep my mask on and I would lift a little weight, like a little three pound weight <laughs> where I was lifting a 15 pound weight before. And I was happy. I was happy. And so I slowly needed to do that for myself because I was getting depressed. Like, is this what my life is going to be like? Like, I, this is like, I can't walk hardly. I am so nervous. I'm still having to go to the clinic and be checked all the time. I feel so weak. Um, I, you know, and then they reassured me that slowly, gradually, I would, my strength would come back and it did. And so, but one day, this is where I was going with this one day. I really looked bad and I looked in the mirror and I thought, oh, Lord, like you look really not yourself. And then I thought back to what that chaplain had told me one time. She said, Kim, look in the mirror, pick up the hand mirror, look in your eyes and look at yourself that you are not the body, you're a spirit. So it doesn't matter whether you don't have the hair. Right now, you need to pull yourself out of this dark space you're in 
and really reflect on who you are. See the light in your, behind your eyes. And so I remember what she said, and I looked in that mirror, I looked in my eyes, and of course now, you know, I know that the soul is that we say the soul is here in the center of the forehead. But I looked and I said, yeah, I'm not those eyebrows. I'm not those eyelashes. And I'm not that hair. And I got that gas mask on and I <laughs> went down the hallway by myself and I went to the gym. I wiped everything down. And that's the word, one thing that I, I did do. The doctors told me, don't go to that, ho that, don't go to that hotel gym. But I thought, no, I have to do something. I'm getting so depressed. So I would go down there secretly and I would go into that gym and I would work out just a little bit, just a little bit to make myself feel like at least I'm getting some strength back slowly, slowly. But that was such a powerful experience of, again, realizing that I'm much more than what I think I am. I'm a soul. I'm a spirit. And the spirit is fighting. The spirit is getting stronger. And then when the spirit gets stronger, then the body's going to get stronger. The body's going to follow. And I realize that the mind and body have a very close relationship. So when COVID hit, some people saw that as, oh, my Lord, I can't do this. I can't do this. And some people were coming unglued, you know. I mean, domestic violence increased in homes and there was more drinking and some, not, not this home, but not a lot of homes, I know. But, but things happened and there were marital fights and there were economic problems and people were bored. I can't go out to eat. I can't vacation. I can't get on the plane. And actually, I thought because of meditation and Raja Yoga, I found it quite lovely. I mean, not that it was a horrible thing that people got sick and, and you know, um, a lot of people had long term consequences. But I found that through Zoom, I was able to be in my own space. And I was able to go all over the world if I wanted to. And I was able to get connected with San Francisco because I was pretty much just connected to Fresno. And we're a really small group here. And so I was able to get a bigger perspective on the Brahma Kamaris. And that opened up newness to me. It opened up more food for my spirit. It gave me new vitality. I became a little bit more adventurous, a little less closed, um, open to meeting new people, new faces. And that has been an awesome experience for me. And I was even able to just sit and relax with my meditation um, and kind of experiment with it more. I know that sounds weird, but I mean, if, you're, if your mind is your thoughts and your feelings and in your mind, you create experiences and you can create images for yourself, well, then why can't I sit here and let go more and create more of an experience, experience for myself? And when I connect with God, I can let go more and I can just be in that light you know go to that light and and that's what happened and then I joined this awesome group to where I just resonated with the teaching the teachings are the same they're the very same but I got a little deeper meaning and understanding of Raja Yoga and I got to hear a lot about the original beginnings. And I thought that was so exciting, you know, because I've always felt that women are, they have a lot of freedom, but they still don't have as much freedom sometimes as men do. And I don't mean to discriminate. I am not. But sometimes in the working world, I have found that 
sometimes strong women are a threat to some people. And so you have to tread carefully. And sometimes you even have to hold back. And I have been so thankful that the Brahma Kumaris talk about the upliftment of women, the empowering of the soul. And we're not talking feminism. We're not talking go out there and demonstrate. <laughs> we're talking that it's it's good to be nurturing and it's good to find it's good for men to find their feminine side and it's good for women to find their masculine side and it's okay because i have considered myself actually very pretty androgynous you know as a tomboy as a child and so i like to climb trees i like to later i like to get on motorcycles you know um i like to ski i li- i was always very physical So I like to explore and I like to to learn new things. And so when I think of a balance, I think that God is not a gender. He's a being of light and that I am not a gender. And so that to be in balance, it's okay to be that perfect image of masculine and feminine traits because that's who I am and I'm okay with that today and I don't have to if you don't approve of that it's okay with me if somebody gets insecure with that it's okay with me I don't need to fight it I just need to be oh my gosh that is huge right there (laughs) so I'll stop there and um, ask for, what do we do from here, Sister Elizabeth? Oh, we're fine. Um, we have, you have still 10 minutes, but we could open up for some questions. I was, I had no idea that you had those challenges. I never, of all these years I've known you. Oh, I have had challenges. I could go on and on. <laughs> But I won't. But yeah. I liked how you uh, shared what, you know, some key steps, sort of steps on how you got yourself out of it. And that, well, finding community, um, finding yourself, um, getting your your guts, you know, your your chutzpah, I don't know, that's your courage and um, and celebrating it. Um and you were saying kind of that balanced energy, right? So if you had any um, like qualities or steps that you could identify that would be helpful to us, you know, just to think about, you know, you, it's now it's out there, you put it out on the table, um, your experience. What would you say what qualities that helped you turn this around that this traumatic event became um, steps to elevating you or um, making you more of who you are? What do you think keywords that for you, just off the top of your head? Love. Love? Love. I thought I knew how to love, but now I know what true love is. True love for myself, true love for God, and true love for others. And so I give from a deep uh, sense of, I, I think before I could be manipulative at times to get what I wanted. Um. I try to come from a place of integrity and honesty. And, um, you know, I could even see through the kids that I worked with how I could be a little manipulative. I could be a little dishonest. <laughs> and and, um, and how I had learned that in my teenage years through some acting out that I had done. And how I really wanted to turn that around, um, that I could even see that there was some of that in my adult years. Um, We may have the degrees, 
but we're not perfect inside. Um, just because you've gone to a school where they teach you about clinical psychology doesn't mean that you've perfected all the defects within yourself. And there may be some unhealthy behaviors that are going on that you're hiding or that are in your past that you're afraid to let people know about. And so a lot of times that's where the ego grows to protect yourself. Um, because people will say, you have a PhD, come to this meeting, we need you. You're here to save the world, we need your knowledge. And you're just a person. And a lot of times you are in the flash of a moment making a decision that you hope is the right, you know? And um, I, I feel that I don't have any shame over anything I've done. I've always tried to advocate honesty and integrity for all my clients and protect them if they needed to. And I made lots of reports when I needed to, and I've never been afraid to do that. So I think that for me, I fear, um, through trauma is less fear of death, less, uh, no fear of God, no fear of God anymore. Um, wow. Yeah, no fear. Because I felt his presence and he let me know, I love you. I accept you. Mm -hmm. And there were people that didn't make it through. There was, a, I'll just say real quick. Through the trauma, I met a Vietnam vet at Stanford. We were both at the table going through our scenario, of what we needed to do, what our caretaker needed to do for us um, post-transplant. And he was older than me, and he knew that there was a good chance he wouldn't make it through the treatment. If the cancer won't kill you, the treatment might. And so he gave me his... Um, what do you call it when they are a hero, their medal? Oh, the purple yeah. one? Yeah. No. Yes. The purple heart. Yeah. Whoa, that's one of the biggest medals. Yeah. So I looked him up and he did not survive. He'd never laid, he never left Stanford. He didn't make it through the transplant. Oh. And I felt like, I don't know for sure, but I, 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 it's just, I felt that maybe God was inspiring. I don't know. I, I really don't know, but God knows everything, right? He knows the beginning, the middle, and the end. And that medal is so important to me. It was such kindness for him to do that. It was such fearlessness on his part. He was a warrior. And I have to be a spiritual warrior. I have to be strong. <laughs> I don't have to be, but I consider myself a spiritual warrior. He was a, he was a warrior. He was, a, and I met so many angels on my path in the hospital. I met women that were dying, that prayed for me. Can you imagine? They were on their deathbed that I was in the transfusion room getting blood and they were beside me, they were dying. And they, they weren't feeling sorry for themselves. They were angels. And they were saying, you know, you're gonna go to Stanford, you're gonna get more time. I'm gonna pray it's successful. And, you know, they're an inspiration for me of how I must be when I meet another person that maybe has just had the diagnosis or they're going through something traumatic in their life. And I just try to show up and, and do what God would want me to do. That's all I can do. Wow. And I may never, I will never see that person again, but I can see their face. I can see the light in their eyes. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I can, and I can know that they're going to God or they're, you know, going to another. Well, thank you, Kim. So, can, can, can we close with a meditation? Okay. Okay. So uh, let's just begin with um, just sitting silently. 
and not being afraid to be with yourself. Just be completely open. And if you could just, it's an image. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol, symbolic picture of that heart being held in your hands. That's like holding your inner child. You're holding your inner child, your spirit, your soul, so precious, so fine, so loving, and so peaceful. Find that peace within and just hold that feeling for a moment. And before you go to bed tonight, before you retire and close your eyes, just be in that peace and that silence and take that feeling into your sleep. That's what I do every night. And do you know, I hit that, peel, that pillow and I'm, I'm out like a light. And so with the meditation, you can feel so light. Just practice being light. Feeling like a feather, just floating up. You're not leaving your body, but it's like you're, you're out of your body and you're just flying like a feather up through the atmosphere, connecting with the source, calling in the source and connecting and feeling those rays of happiness feeling that God, the source, the light, is the master of your garden, your heart. He's the master of the garden. And your heart is the garden. And so just plant some powerful seeds for yourself and allow him to help you tend to that garden. And the seeds are your thoughts. And carry a powerful thought into your sleep tonight. Whatever that thought may be, make it positive and powerful. And then just let go. And know that the master is always with you. And you won't be afraid anymore. Thank you so much. Om Shanti.